coming up on Saturday. And so remember him uh, that the Lord is going to bless him with some good understanding and, and calm nerves and all those things that go on. So keep him in your prayers. Uh, Brother Boatman made it through his uh, surgery, and uh, that was this afternoon, so that wasn't too very long ago. And uh, he's got one more coming next Wednesday, so a week away. Uh, be praying that that uh, takes the effect that it needs to. Uh, otherwise, the next thing is much more aggressive. But uh, they're hoping that this is going to be able to work for the glaucoma surgery. And uh, but certainly remember him in prayer as he recovers. Remember Brother George. He's doing doing pretty good according to Miss Linda and you know, <laughs> but he's doing great so glad uh, that he's recovering well uh, brother Ty uh, remember David May also in your prayers this is uh, for the uh, Miss Tamara's friend's dad and uh, we had him I mentioned him last Wednesday that he had had emergency heart surgery and they believe that he's had a stroke uh, he's still making some contact and everything but but not very good and so if you'd remember him in recovery sure would appreciate that uh, as well and remember Carl Thomas uh, the, uh, keep praying that he gets uh, better and gets strengthened uh, a few things on the notes remember Bible publishing month going on all month so if you're able to give toward that sure would appreciate it men's meeting after the service getting ready for the business meeting next weekend and so we'll go over just a few things tonight and then picnic at the McDougal's on Saturday amen so that should be a great time all around any other prayer request updates anything brother Coy all right Okay. Did they actually get that found found out? Because he said they were still waiting on results this afternoon. Yeah, they're, they're waiting on, you should find out tomorrow. Okay. So they're exposed to something, but they're right. they're making sure they're staying staying away in case, in case they have whatever. All right. Any others, Miss Sarah? Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Any others? Remember Brother Reed? He's not feeling very well. He's up there at the top uh, tonight, so don't shake his hand. And, uh, <laughs> but, but he's still manning the cameras for everybody, so appreciate that. And I think that's all. All right, we've got an update from Joel Haynes' family. <clears throat> One of my favorites to be able to read from. Always exciting to hear from at the Navajo Nation. First off, he says, with so much to report, I'll not delay to jump right into the events of the past two months. Tyrone and Laura had begun attending our services during a 26-week stretch of drive-up drive services last year. Both claimed to be saved, but after a months of Bible preaching, they came to the realization that they were both lost. On January the 3rd, they responded during the invitation and accepted Christ as Savior. What a great start to the year. We also had our soul winning campaign for the month of January that saw over 1,500 door hangers and tracks distributed, 20 first-time visitors and services, and four souls saved in just five weeks. The top three soul winning pairs were awarded with a certificate and a classic soul winner's New Testament. I was encouraged to see Joel Jr., that's his son, and his partner, Deshaun Sagay, place third in the campaign. Amen. Next, the Bible College continues to be greatly used of God as we have some very promising young men and women training for ministry. You don't get points for potential, but, you certainly, but certainly the potential in these students does inspire a measure of hope and optimism for the Lord's work on the reservation moving forward. The Bible College hosted a training seminar on discipleship in January and saw 14 pastors along with over 50 additional church workers attend. Free materials were distributed and phenomenal practical instruction was provided by Brother James Hoffmeister. This was an excellent way to uh, this was an excellent way to lead into mobile training modules for pastors across the reservation. Navajo people are capable of accomplishing just as much as people of any uh, of any people group in the world if simply equipped and empowered to do so. We're grateful that God is using the Bible College after nearly 10 years of existence to continue equipping Navajo people to reach all people. We took, a 14, we took 14 soul winners to the remote community of Black Mesa on a recent Saturday morning. Black Mesa sits about 40 minutes from our church in Pinon. The recurring sentiment from the folks we talked to was a sadness that, quote, there aren't any churches in Black Mesa. While in the past several have existed of various denominations, all have closed. After visiting over 80 residences and giving out the gospel seven uh, different times, the Lord laid on my heart to begin preparations for a vacation Bible school in the community in the summer of 2022. We want to keep busy plowing up fields and praying God raises up men to plant churches where we've prepared the spiritual soil for it. In closing, I'd like to share a barrage of matters 
for which <laughs> your praying would be most appreciated. We are hosting our own youth camp for the first time this summer where we live in Nazalini, Arizona. Pray that God will get hold of the young people to surrender their lives to the Lord's service in any capacity. In June, Stronghold Baptist Church will take on the responsibility of a young couple graduating from Bible college as staff interns, then send them out to plant churches in Chinle, Arizona, and its surrounding areas. This will also involve building a parsonage where they can live right in Pinon. This would also serve as a guest house for speakers and mission trip groups in the future once the couple is established with living quarters of their own future church site in Chinle. Uh, if you remember in the past, I know if you hadn't been there, this won't make as much sense, but where Brother Joel lives in Nazalini, uh, it's about uh, 40, no, it's about 30 minutes to uh, wherever the Bible college is. I can't think of the name of it. It was another 60 miles or so on to Pinon. And he was making that round trip every single day uh, whenever he was doing that. So now they've got another, which is basically what they do. They try to go about every 40 miles or so to be able to find a community to be able to plant a church so that the people have a place to be able to go to. Uh, so whenever he's talking about making that parsonage there, man, that's going to be a major central hub for them to go to outside of having to drive 120 miles every single day of their life. So uh, if you'd like to participate in helping this building project along, it would be a worthy investment for the overall work of the Central Navajo Re uh, Nation region. As always, pray for our family. My five mighty men are growing physically and in the Lord. Fabiola and I are both loving our, our life, serving the Lord with one another. Uh, there's no greater life in all the world than to get to serve our precious Savior on the mission field. Until our next communication, may our Lord bless and keep you all as you abide in Him. Spreading the light in Navajo land for the Joel Haynes. All right, that's wonderful. Well, let's all stand together and we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Brother Dennis, would you open us in prayer this evening? Amen. Let's take your Heavenly Highways hymn book. Turn over to page 304. Page 304. I want to know more about my Lord. <clears throat> While traveling through this world of sorrow, I'm on my way. tomorrow. My trials here I'll understand. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about that mansion I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland. I mean to go there someday somehow And after I reach that heavenly city I mean to know more than I know now I'm glad I know the blessed Savior For through His blood He set me free Though up the road I shall not waver for some glad day his face I'll see. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about that mansion I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland. I mean to go there someday somehow and after I reach that heavenly city I mean to know more than I know now 
he promised when his soul ascended I'm coming back the Lord did say if on his promise you've depended on wings of love you'll soar away I want to know more about my Jesus I want to know more about my Lord I want to know more about that mansion I'm gonna receive as my reward I want to know more about that homeland I mean to go there someday somehow and after I reach that heavenly city I mean to know more than I know singing especially over here in this section good job girls 310 page 310 the rest y'all got to keep up amen <clears throat> i don't 310 my god is real <clears throat> Feel him deep within. My God is real, real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. Some folk may die, some folk may can go on and leave me alone but as for me I'll take God's part and God is real for I can feel him in my heart my God is real real in my soul my God is real for he is lost and made me whole his love for me is like your goal. My God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. I cannot tell just how you felt when Jesus took your sins away. Since that day, yes, since that hour, God has been real, for I can feel His holy power. My God is real, real in my soul. My God is real, for He is washed and made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. Amen. All right, y'all can be seated. We're just going to do one more this evening. Turn over to 149. 149. <clears throat> the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Cross, they nailed his 
precious hands and in death he boldly paid the cost there is pardon in his love for everyone that stands for the blood the stain the old rugged cross twas his blood his precious blood that stained the old Twas his love that paid the awful cost. Oh, souls so far astray, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross. What an awful death he died to pardon you and me. All alone in agony he tossed And the world once lost in sin Can now be wholly free By the blood that stained the old rugged cross T'was his blood, his precious blood That stained the old rugged cross T'was his love that paid the awful cost. Oh, soul so far astray, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Amen. Appreciate you singing this evening. King's Kids dismissed. And if everybody else will take your Bibles, let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 5. Isaiah, chapter number 5. <clears throat> We're still building the story, amen? <clears throat> He's already painted a great picture for us. Isaiah, chapter number 5, if you're able, then I invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God. We'll look at a couple of verses of Isaiah, chapter number 5. So beginning in verse number one, <clears throat> it says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath the vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it. He also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and brought forth wild grapes. I want to bring our message this evening of an old-fashioned love song. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for this day that you've given us. What a great privilege it is to be able to come into your house and to be able to sing wonderful songs of praise to you. And Lord, to be challenged in your word as we study it. I pray, Father, that you would help us give us understanding, Lord, and, and help us to be becoming of uh, the name of Christ. And we, we desire that more than anything. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would help us to be more like you. And we pray, Father, that you'd give us wisdom in this hour. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. So we began looking at the book of Isaiah and saw, uh, saw a picture of rebellion uh, that was fueled by ingratitude. Uh, the country is being wasted away, would have been completely destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah if it wouldn't have been for a faithful remnant of the people that held to God. Uh, their worship had become very ritualistic and empty, uh, but God was still willing to receive them. He was still interested in, in being the God of, of His people. There were two things that He wanted them to do. He said in chapter 1 verse number 19 that He wanted them to be willing, and he wanted them to be obedient. But if they continued in their idolatry, he said, I'm going to turn you into tow. Remember, that means tender. He said, I'm going to use you to be able to start a fire that's going to be able to burn up you and your idols and the whole mess of you. And so uh, that was good incentive. Then Isaiah had a vision of what would occur on the day of the Lord. Uh, and uh, it was the, the day that that old corruption would be passed, the new rule would be in holiness and righteousness, uh, there would be judgment that would fall upon the ungodly, uh, idols would be removed, the place would be a peace, it would be a peace on earth, and we saw that that can only take place by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And then last week uh, Isaiah began to bemoan the spiritual leadership of the place. The men were supposed to be leading, uh, they were supposed to lead 
uh, back to God. And yet instead, uh, the leading, he said, whenever all of those in, in any kind of form of leadership, he said, it's going to be completely taken away from you. And he said, the ones that are going to lead you are the women and the children. And uh, there's probably some very capable women to be able to lead, maybe even some kids. But it wasn't the role, it wasn't the responsibility that God had given them. It wasn't God's order. So that lack of leadership came uh, because there was a spiritual dearth in the land. He said, the, the men aren't leading. You're not, you're not leading the people in the way that, uh, that they're supposed to be with God. And God would judge the nation. So we get to chapter number five, and, and here's Isaiah. Now think about this. This is the man's man. He's the one that's, that's uh, preaching to the, uh, to the nation there, telling them about the judgment of God. And imagine this. He's, he's already kind of painting a picture for them, and he says, I'm going to sing a song for you. I want to, I want to, let me sing for you here. That seems a little bit out of character, amen? Uh, but it appeals to the, to the, to the uh, people. They're going to start to understand a little bit about what's going on through the song that he's going to sing. And he's going to sing a farming song. Amen. Man, that's going to strike a chord, literally. There's a pun for you. And I didn't even mean to. <clears throat> but uh, and so it's going to be a great farming song. So let's look a little bit at this uh, song. Look at verse number one. He says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Now a few things that we're going to notice about this, and, and, um, and if you know anything about farming, there's a few things that you have to have when you're farming. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're farming tomatoes or grapes, the vineyard or peas or whatever the case. You have to have, start off, you've got to have good soil. Amen? Uh, if you don't have good soil, you're not growing anything. You have to have good seeds or good plants. You have to be able to protect those plants. You have to be able to do that. And then whenever it's harvest time, you have to have a place to be able to store that harvest that comes in. Otherwise, it's all going to be wasted. It's going to be for nothing at all. So in this song, he begins to explain all of the things that have been given so that it can truly be a, uh, a great harvest. In the song, he explains, he says, uh, in the very first verse, he says, there is a, uh, there is a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. A very fruitful hill. Now think about this. He says it's a very fruitful hill. Nothing's been planted there yet. Amen. It, the hill itself is, is fruitful. Uh, the very first thing that we notice is the hill that's chosen has uh, got a great purpose for this vineyard. He didn't get, uh, he didn't get stuck with uh, some washed out property and said, well, we've we got to try to make something grow here. Let's just throw some vines. He looked at it and he said, this is a fruitful hill. That means there's a lot of potential right here. He said the harvest can be made right here. In the area that, I, that I'm given, he says this is, this is a good piece of ground. The potential was there. It was fertile. Uh, the, nu uh, the nutrition was there to be able to make everything uh, take place. And not only that, but the landowner went to work to ensure that it was going to be a complete success. So look at verse number 2. It says he fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. Now that's a lot of work. Started off, it says he, he fenced it. Whenever you, whenever you fence a property, it means that uh, there are people or there are varmints or something that you don't want there. Amen? That's the purpose of having the fence there. It's funny, uh, whenever you don't have a, pen, a fence, because people kind of think it's free reign. Amen? It's kind of like riding on a road with no lines painted on it. Everybody thinks just because you got 40 feet without a line, you know that you get the whole thing. You don't. Amen? You got to have the lines. Well, the same thing is true with the fences. A lot of time, if, if a fence is not there, then people think that they have the free range over that property. I remember one night we were at the old parsonage before I uh, built the new one, <clears throat> and uh, I think it was graduation night, something like that. There were a lot of cars over here. No services going on, a lot of cars. And uh, so anyway, I was kind of keeping an eye, eye on everything. Having to look out there in the front, and here comes this guy walking across my front yard. Just... <laughs> I mean, big as that. Had a 12-pack with him. He was having a great time. So I walked out there to the front, and I said, Hey, you must be lost. He said, Oh, uh, uh, no, uh, I, was looking for, I was looking for my friends over there. I was like, Your friends are not here. You don't see any of your friends here. You are mistaken. You have no friends here. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I need to go. And I said, hey, Get rid of that stuff. Say it'll ruin your life. You pull that out. Get out of here. Don't you park in a parking lot either. We don't want it there. Don't want it here. Okay. He just kind of assumed because there's no fence there that he could just come parading right across the front yard like it's no big deal. That's what happens when you don't have fences. Amen. 
But whenever offense, offense says, this is mine to everybody around. Amen. That's the message that is pervaded. Before the landowner invests all of his time, before he does anything else, he puts up the fence and he says, this is mine. He says, this is a very fruitful hill. This is mine. There's going to be a harvest here, but, but this is mine. And then he gathers out the stones was the second thing he does. That's no small task. You know, whenever tilling, tilling up the pea patch over there, every year I'm going to uh, uncover, I don't know, half a dozen bricks or rocks, you know, that's, that I've got to get out. Maybe. Half dozen. It's not the same way there. Uh, Israel is rocky. Uh, it's, it's just rocks. The, uh, the rabbis had a, had a legend that they would tell that whenever it was time for God to put rocks throughout the, uh, throughout the entire world, he got Gabriel and he put all the rocks in a sack and said, Gabriel, go distribute the rocks throughout the, uh, throughout the world. And whenever he went over Israel, the, rock, the, uh, the sack broke and the rocks all fell out in Israel. Yeah. It's just one of the legends that they tell. But the, the truth is there are just tons and tons of rocks and that means to be able to remove all of those stones is going to be long and hot and tedious work. But if the land's going to be planted, guess what? The stones had to be removed. You got to get it out, amen. It's still a fruitful hill. And now think about this because the landowner is able to look at that and he's, he's able to look past the stones. He's able to look past all the, uh, all the hindrances and say, this is going to be a fruitful place to be. This is going to be a fruitful hill. There's going to be a lot of good harvest that's going on. Next it says he planted with the choicest vine. When you want the best, you're going to be willing to pay for the best. Amen. You're going to start with the best. The landowner was willing to invest. Then it says he built a tower in the midst. Now, why would you do that? I mean, he's already got the fence. Why would you build a tower? The, what they would do is they would put up a tower there, and that was kind of like the guard shack. So whenever you've got your hill, anybody that happens to come in, you could say, hey, throw your rock at them, you know, whatever, and, and get them out. Now, why would you do that if you got a fence? heard the expression, locks keep honest people honest. Same thing's true with fences. Matter of fact, if we all loaded up and went down to the border tonight, we'd be able to see that regardless of the fence, there's plenty of people that are not turning, they don't walk up to the fence and say, oh man, I didn't realize there was a fence, let's go home. No, no, they find a way to try to get through that area. So here's a, uh, here's a man, he says, man, I'm, I'm willing to build a tower in the midst of it. The Palestin Palestinians still protect their crops in this manner. Here we might use a scarecrow. Uh, but the reason is, is there's, there's too much that's been invested thus far to leave something unprotected. Now think about this in the order that's there. You got the, you got the fence and you're saying, all right, this is mine. You remove all the stones, which is just a small miracle in itself to be able to get all of those things uh, cleared out so that you can plant and then it's ready to go. And you got the choicest vine. The last thing you're going to do is just turn your back on it and just say, well, I hope it all works out. See it in a few months. Now he says he's going to take every precautionary matter to make sure that that harvest is going to occur. And then he goes through and he says, verse number two, that he made a, he also made a wine press therein to make a wine press. How do you do that? Uh, they would take a limestone. It was big. It wasn't like small ones where they would lay them together. Amen. Because you're about to put juice in there, it's going to run through. You would start off with a solid stone, which is limestone. It is a little bit softer, but still primitive tools and all that kind of thing. You're going to be at it a while. But you're going to hew out a place for all those grapes to be uh, able to be stacked in. That's going to be the, uh, the, the, the treading area. And then the juice of it would actually flow. They'd have to construct a little trough. And uh, so you'd have the sludge over on one side. The juice would run down to the collection area. And that would be the place where it kind of vapors off and all that kind of thing to be able to collect uh, as it goes along. A lot of work. A lot of work going, going into it. It was a big deal. They didn't just have like the stock tank out there and said, just put them in the stock. I mean, this was, they had to manually do all of this. To be able to go through that much work, then that owner had to be confident that there's going to be a harvest. Amen. You would never go through that much work if you were looking at it and saying, you know, I don't think anything's going to happen here. I don't, I think this whole thing's just going to play out. I don't think we're going to be able to get the first thing. You would never put that much work into something that you didn't think there was actually going to be a harvest. Now remember, this is a love song. Oh, how I love thee, let me build a fence. Oh, how I love thee, let me pick out the stones. Oh, how I love thee, let me get the choicest vine. Oh, how I love thee, let me, uh, let me uh, put a wine press in the middle. And then look at what happens, verse number 2 down at the end. It says, And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth 
wild grapes. Wild grapes, it literally means poison berries. He says, I looked, he said, this is what I was wanting. He said, rotten fruit. That's what it was. How disappointing. He was wanting so much for that, from that crop that he, he got nothing in return for all of the work and all of the labor that he poured into it. Now right here, Isaiah turns his attention to the audience. All right? He's been singing the song to them, but now he's going to incorporate them into the song. Look at what he says, verse 3 and 4. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more in my, to my vineyard that I have not done it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. He's asking, he says, listen, is the, is the landowner, he said, am, am I the one to blame because the, the vineyard didn't produce as it should? Is there something that I did wrong? What would they say right there? Guarantee you they'd all say, no. I mean, you did everything humanly possible. I mean, they, he spared no expense, no, no effort, no labor. And, and he gave his absolute best. He wasn't the one to blame. So he shares what it is that he's going to do. Verse number five. He says, all right. So he's got the wild grapes. He says, it wasn't the landowner's fault. It's it, it just wild grapes. He says, this is what I'll do. Verse five. And now go, I, and now go to, I will uh, tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned, nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Now, isn't that something? He didn't say that he was going to go through and chop down all the vines. Amen? He didn't say, well, I'm going to set this whole thing on fire. No, he didn't do that. He said what he's going to do, he's going to remove all of the protections that he had established. All of the things that he had done to make sure that it was fortified and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and strengthened to be able to prevail, he says, I'm going to remove all of that protection. He'd remove the hedge. He's going to break down the wall. He said he wouldn't water it. He wouldn't prune it. Everything's going to grow up around it. He, he'd let the briars take it over. And think about this. That was well within the right of the landowner. Amen. He had every right to be able to do so. Now, guaranteed, whenever that happens, you know there's going to be somebody that walks by and says, I wouldn't have done it that way. Tell you what I would have done. But guess what? It doesn't matter, does it? Because that's the landowners. He has every right to be able to take care of it however he sees fit. And about now, the people would be saying, oh, man, this is the most depressing song I've ever heard. <laughs> why do this is three, four times. Hey, man, why are we singing such a sad, sad song? And notice what Isaiah says. All right, so here's, he's got the full thing. He's got the full picture. Look at it, verse number seven. He says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, it means he looked for righteousness, but behold, a cry. The Lord had looked on Israel, and he, he wanted to see good judgment. He wanted to see justice prevail, but instead, all he saw was oppressing. He, he wanted to see the fruit of righteousness, but instead, it says, he beheld a cry. What does that mean? It's a legal term. It's whenever you, uh, like whenever you cry out to somebody or against somebody that has done something wrong. There's that, there's that cry. Think about it. Remember baseball? Back when it was good. And so... Uh, Baseball, uh, you, you hit a line drive, it's going right up the, the first base line, and somebody in the field, they can't really see it. And they can't tell, all of a sudden all eyes go back over to the umpire, and he makes the cry, foul ball! And everybody says, oh, back at it. it was a great hit, no, foul ball! It was, there was the cry out against it. There's no arguing with that authority. The song that was sung was the story of what the Israelites had done to God himself. He had, he had poured himself into it. He said, this is a fruitful hill. He says, this is my people I've, uh, I've established. That He says, it's the choice is fine. I've, I've done everything that I can. I'm looking forward to the harvest. The, the potential was all there. He saw it all. And all the protection was coming to an end because he said, wild grapes. He said, I invested so much. And he says, it wasn't God's fault. And the people confessed that. He said, wild grapes, bad fruit, poison berries. So he gets their attention, and he presents them with the prevailing sins of the day. That's what he starts talking about. second thing that you notice here are the woes. The woes. There are six different woes that are given against them. Now, before we look at the particulars here, uh, 
need to remind it, what exactly is a woe? It's often uh, seen as a point of judgment. But really the judgment is going to be seen later. A woe is not the same thing as a judgment. And this is one of those things, remember in Luke chapter 11, uh, Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees and He said, well, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Remember, and then He'd let them have it. And so He pronounced all His woes. And we, and we think about that. We're like, oh man, the, the Lord is judging them right there. He is pouring it out on them. Why do we do that? Because most of the time whenever we hear those those verses, we're hearing them from a preacher who has got this idea, and he says, "Whoa, what do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites!" You know, and he's just pouring it out. So all of a sudden, we're thinking that must have been what the Lord was saying. That's a misrepresentation of what that word "woe" is all about. The context of those woes <clears throat> in Luke 11 was Jesus had been invited by a Pharisee to dinner. And whenever he came to dinner, he sat down and didn't wash his hands. So the Pharisee was looking at him, and he was shocked. He said, I can't believe that you would sit here, and you wouldn't even wash your hands. What did he do? He had, Jesus had disregarded one of the ceremonies that had been established by him as a religious leader. All of a sudden, Jesus pulled the God card. He was God. And yet, they looked at him, and they said, wait a minute, we established this rule. I can't believe it, that you would disregard what it is that we had said, that you would sit here with unwashed hands. So God was going against man, or what man thought was important. He was going against man's religion. And He's pronouncing the woes in response to that religion. Now again, woe is not a pronouncement of judgment. Woe is an exclamation, obviously the big exclamation point there, but it's an expression of grief. He's not sentencing them. Amen? That's not what it's all about. But he's grieved at what it is that's happening. He's looking at it and he says, oh, get the feel of it. He said, whoa, whoa unto you. Oh, look at what you're doing. Uh, look at how your, your heart is so far against the things of God. That's the woe. That's the cry. That's the burden of the heart of God. It's to be in such a miserable state because God Himself is grieved at their actions. It's the same thing as what we see in our text. The heart of God is being shown to His people that have rebelled against Him, and it grieved Him. He said, whoa, whoa, all oh, the woes that are there. He said, it's breaking the very heart of God because of these things that you've allowed in your life. So the first thing that he noticed, first woe is in verse number 8. It's the woe of greed. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, and they, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ear saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. Now, whenever we start thinking about this, it's, it's land grabbing. So what's going on? He says, I can't believe it. you're taking all this land. Now, at the point, you can't really tell exactly, you know, maybe it was, uh, you know, maybe they were doing it as a favor. You know, maybe they were just trying to have a more sustainable life, and they were wanting to plant more gardens and help feed their family and all that kind of thing. Uh, but y if you turn over to Micah, uh, turn right in your Bible, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Micah chapter 2 uh, remember Micah is going on the same time here as Isaiah, and he begins to explain something else, a little bit of extra detail about this, <clears throat> this very thing. So Micah chapter 2, in verse number 1, I'll give you just a minute. If you get to Nahum, you got too far. Micah 2, verse number 1 and 2, it says, Woe to them that devise iniquity, and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it, because it is the power of their hand. And they covet fields, and take them by violence, and houses, and take them away. So they oppress a man, and his house, even a man, and his heritage. It wasn't just people that were looking for a more sustainable income or land to farm on. They were taking advantage of the poor. They were taking over other people's property by violence if necessary. And it wasn't just booting somebody from their home or from their, their farming ground. He says their entire heritage. Your, your whole life, what it is that you have to offer that came down from parents to parents and, and to your kids is, is removing their entire heritage. Their greed would, would ultimately lead to their own poverty. 
He says, this is what it is behind it. But he says, you got to look ahead to see what's going to happen. He says, there's going to be a lot of poverty that's going on. Look at verse number 10 back in our text. It says, yea, <coughs> ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. Ten acres of vineyard for one bath. That means they weren't able to bear fruit. One bath is about eight gallons of juice. Now, get that in your mind for just a minute. Ten acres. Ten acres. And he said, you'll get enough to carry around in a five-gallon bucket. He said, that's what's, that's what's happening, about eight gallons, you know, so two buckets. So, one acre of vineyard produces less than one gallon of juice. Can you imagine that? An entire acre and you come out with a gallon? So, one ephah that it's talking about, it's talking about an ephah and a homer. An ephah is one-tenth of a homer. So, they're losing nine-tenths of their seed. Nine-tenths of it is gone. So, uh, think of a, if an ephah is about a bushel, a homer is ten bushels. Now, what's happening, though, is whenever they're planting, they're, they're losing ten times. He said, you plant ten acres and you come out with one. You, you plant, uh, look at it, verse, uh, uh, verse number ten, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. The seed of a homer, so ten bushels, shall yield an ephah, one bushel. Imagine that. Uh, if you're planting, typically uh, you, you come out with a lot of food and then you have the seed left over to be able to plant again next year too. Instead, he says, you're going to plant 10 bushels worth of stuff. He said, you'll get one bushel in return. You can't even eat it, and that's not even enough to be able to seed for next year. He said, you're getting nothing. There's this uh, exponential decrease in what's there. He said, you can't even eat on that. You won't be able to live on it for sure. Verse number 11, there's another woe. He says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. They're, these are the heavy drinkers, the woe of carousing. They didn't have anything else to do. They start in the morning. They continue all the way through the night. They're unaware. They don't know anything that God is even working, that He's even doing anything, and they're unaware of the doom that's there. They don't understand what it is that's right below them. Now look at what it says. Uh, we'll start at verse number 12 and go down a little ways. And the harp and the viol, the tabret, the pipe, the wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. They're not concerned about God. He said, man, they're having a high old time. They're, 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 they're drunkenness. There's all the music that's going on. But he said, they're not, they're not paying attention to what God's doing. Verse 13, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Now watch verse 14. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. He says hell is waiting for them. He said it's like a gaping mouth that's just ready to, to swallow them up. They don't even know it. He said, they're going on about their business. They're, they're doing the drinking. They're doing the carousing. They don't understand that hell is enlarged right underneath them. It's like those in, in Korah that rebelled against uh, Moses and, and Aaron. Number 16.32 says, The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that uh, uh, appertained unto Korah and all their goods. That's the end of drunkards as well. He says, woe. Oh, what a great woe. Does that sound anything like what we deal with today? Imagine the people. You can check your, you know, how many, how many people got arrested? Check it in the morning in the paper. Last night, whenever they could have been in church for some kind of a drunken response. Not knowing that hell waits. Man, what a horrible, horrible situation. Verse number 18. Woe unto them that draw, iniqui uh, that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope, that say, Let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. This is the woe of mocking God. Mocking God. They're harnessed in with their, with their sin. They draw it after them like, a, like an oxen draws a cart. They're just yoked in with it. And at the same time, they, they challenge God to judge them. Let's go ahead and see how fast we can bring about that judgment. Verse number 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's the woe of confusion. 
Sin had taken such a part in their life that they had no idea how to make any moral judgments whatsoever. They get to the point where they can't even tell the difference between good and evil. They can't tell the, the difference. You know, imagine looking out the door and saying, I can't tell if it's dark outside, if it's light outside. I, I can't tell if something's sweet, if it's, if it's bitter. You know, people say that a lot today. They say, well, you know, it's such a fine line between right and wrong. I mean, just go ahead and say, it is not. Man, right and wrong are polar opposites. Right. I mean, it's not a fine line. The only way to think that it's similar or to think that you cannot differentiate between the two is the testimony that you don't know what truth is. Whenever you start to entertain error, you know what happens? You start to get very confused about what it is that God actually says. You can have something you were absolutely solid on. You understood this is what the Bible says. You start entertaining people that take you down the wrong path, the wrong road. Won't be long. You start to question, well, I don't know. What does the Bible say? Easy enough, amen. That's right. Let God be true and every man a liar. Verse number 21, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. That's woe to the, the proud. These are the self-made men, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're always looking for something else, but, not, but, but they're denying the very Lord that is right there. Verse number 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked, for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. This is a woe to those that pervert judgment. We've already talked about the drunks. But these are Israel's men of distinction. These are the heroes. These are the ones who know how to socialize their sin. Their fate was sealed. They would, they would burn up. They would blow away. Look at what it says in verse number 24. Therefore as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. All of these characteristics, they're grieving the very heart of God. Think about this. He's going through and he's explaining all these things. He's already, he's already had the song. He's already explained how much that he loves the, uh, loves the people and how much expectation that he had looking forward to the harvest and how much he had invested. But then there was that rebellion that was there. And, and now they look around and all of this sin is there. The, the mocking God and the confusion and the pride and the perverted judgment and the carousing and, and the greed and all of the things. And he says, whoa, whoa. He said, oh, it's just such a grieving that's taking place. They could never fulfill his will whenever they're overrun with their own sin. He wants them to see it. That brings up the judgment. Look down to verse number 25. He says, therefore, now don't miss that very first word. Now think about this. Everything that we just talked about, he's painting a picture. He's, he's laying it out there. Isaiah is doing a much better job than I ever could. Amen. He is laying all this out. They're seeing it with their eyes. They're confessing it with their mouth. They're recognizing exactly what's going on in their own hearts and their own uh, homes and all the things that are there. And Isaiah says, therefore, because of all of that, is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. And he hath stretched forth his hand against them and hath smitten.